Thank you, Fred, and thank you all for coming and having me. Uh, I wanted to start my discussion with basically sort of going back and going back a, a long time. I, I think it's uh, very interesting for an Icelander here to be in Canada, not least because uh, if you look at history uh, and go far back, go 50, 60,000 years back, Homo sapiens started sort of migrating out of North Africa. Some of them went to Europe, some of them went east. Uh, of those that went east through Siberia, they then came to America. It's estimated around 14,000 years ago. But that migration, that circle, wasn't closed until uh, basically Icelanders came to Canada uh, in the year 1000. That's when you had uh, Homo sapiens having circumnavigated the entire Earth and settled most of it. But population growth at that time wasn't really high. If you look at, for instance, at the graph that I, I have here, if you look at uh, how many Homo sapiens there were on the planet, it was only, it took them around 50,000 years to reach 1 billion. It then only took them 130 years to reach the second billion. And around the time I was born in 1970, they reached the third. Uh, in 2040, there will probably be around 9 billion. So basically the human population will triple uh, while I'm around. Uh, what th does that mean? It basically means that the necessity for commodities is ever rising. It basically means that the, the, the demand for land, the demand for migration is, is, is constantly rising. So what I wanted to tell you first is how I see this a little bit. I'm especially interested in the Arctic. If you look at the eight Arctic countries, you can see on this slide here that uh, Canada and Russia sort of dominate the Arctic. Alaska, of course, uh, is, is, is a considerable part, and so is Greenland, which now belongs to Denmark, is under the Kingdom of Denmark. But the smaller ones are Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. It's interesting that of all these eight countries, they all have their own currency. We have a ruble in Russia, of course. We have a euro in Finland. We have a Swedish krona in Sweden and a Norwegian krona in Norway, Danish krona in Denmark, and an Icelandic krona in Iceland. And then, of course, the Canadian dollar and the American dollar. If we look at how the world is developing and, and the exploration and, and the uh, demand for commodities is rising, uh, the new sort of frontier is going to be the Arctic. Uh, who does the Arctic belong to? Uh, it's uh, legally uh, settled that the eight Arctic countries which form the Arctic Council, they manage the exploitation, exploration I mean, and the harvesting <laughs> of the Arctic. Uh, if we look at uh, what lies in the Arctic, we have uh, oil and gas. Uh, it's considered to be up to a quarter of, of the fossil fuels around. Uh, some of the largest sort of reservoirs of fresh water. And uh, then there are new territories opening up. The reason being that due to climate change, uh, the nature is moving further and further north. We see that uh, basically plants and animals are moving north at the speed of uh, one foot per day. So uh, just over two meters per week. And this is constantly taking place. So with that, we see population, we see human, we see the Homo sapiens going further and further and further north. What follows, of, of course, increased shipping, increased tourism, and increased business. So if you look at what these countries, these eight countries, have in common, they have a lot in common. However, there is very little that they have been dealing, sort of, intra-group, uh, but I see that changing. I see that changing dramatically. And first, I, I think that uh, a more unified or uh, fewer currencies within this uh, group of eight countries would help. I then want to look at Iceland, and I want to see Iceland is part of this group. Where should Iceland sort of situate or position itself? Iceland uh, had this massive financial collapse in 2008, uh, but it's not yet out. Uh, there are still problems there. 
stepped, uh, multiplied after the collapse, even though the Icelanders had the foresight of not guaranteeing their banks. So if we look at, for instance, where the, 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 the payments are coming up, and I, I just take the government debt, there are massive repayments coming up in the next four years. So in Icelandic krona terms, which doesn't say much, it's uh, 800 billion ISK. But in, in real money, like the Canadian dollar, we can estimate it to be around uh, 6 billion Canadian dollars. Right now in Iceland, they don't have a current account surplus. Uh, they're actually having a current account deficit. So they need more inflows to, to pay for these upcoming outflows. And if we look at anyone who has a debt issue, there are two ways out. One is to increase revenues. The other way is to uh, lower payments, either by renegotiating the debt or getting lower interest rates on its debt. The current government in Iceland has in its manifesto that it wants to join the EU. Uh, however, there are certain uh, problems within the EU which are highly publicized. Uh, if we look at also how long that would take, that would take very long. Uh, for Iceland, for instance, to meet the Maastricht criteria, which is essential to meet, to be able to adopt the euro, it will take more than a decade. If we look at these repayments coming up in four years' time, a decade is too long. Because it's not in many places in the world that time is money is more true than actually in Iceland right now. <coughs> If things go ahead, and, and as they're going right now, it's hard to foresee anything else than Iceland could actually default on its government debt. And a default on government debt is much more severe than the collapse of a few private banks, or even all private banks. So I think that Iceland is in a, in a, in a very difficult situation, which it needs to get out of. But there's a reason for them being in this situation, and the reason is quite simple. The reason is that they have uh, capital controls, and with the capital controls, it means that there are no investments. Investments into Iceland are non-existent, the reason being that uh, internationals do not want to lock up their capital in Iceland. They are unsure if they can ever take it out because of the controls. Also because of the controls, uh, locals are, are uneasy and want to uh, escape the controls and get out, so they're not really willing to commit capital to long-term investments. So the way out is basically to abolish the capital controls. But how can one abolish these capital controls? The controls in place in Iceland were put there in 2008 to try to stem the panic. Since then, They've just been uh, enforced and made stricter every day and every time they are trying to uh, uh, revisit this issue. So uh, right now, with the capital controls, they're actually quite stricter than controls that you had in Eastern Europe during the, the, the communist era there. So Icelanders can no longer travel freely. They have to apply for, to uh, get currency to, to travel. Uh, I was asked when I was flying out of Reykjavik and, and went to the bank to, to, to take out a, a couple of thousand Canadian dollars how long I, I was going to stay and, and if I had the right to take out this money if I had traveled before within the month, etc., etc. So Icelanders are not really free with these capital controls. There are three ways to abolish capital controls. One is, of course, to have the currency float, uh, just to abolish them and to see what happens. Unfortunately, the experience Icelanders have with the krona, the current monetary policy, is such that uh, the krona would collapse if they would abolish the capital controls. And with the uh, currency collapsing, it's, it's actually quite risky that the financial sector might collapse once more. Um, the other way that the government hopes to take is to basically abolish the, gov the capital controls by entering the EU and then entering the EMU and adopting the euro. But there is also a problem there, not only the time factor that I mentioned, that this takes far too long. Uh, there is also a problem that the EU never accepts countries which have capital controls. So they first would need to lift them, see what happens, and then they could try to join. So that doesn't solve the problem. 
So the problem solver here is adopting an international currency. And then the question is, which currency? I want to propose that they adopt the Canadian currency. The reason being that, like I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, there are very common interests between Iceland and Canada in the Arctic. I also want to include Greenland a little bit in this, because Greenland is, uh, is a very uh, interesting country. It's 23 times the size of Iceland. It is, has a population of around 55,000 people. But it's the oldest rock formations you find on Earth. They're around 4,500 million years old. Meanwhile, Iceland is around 10 million years old. So you have the oldest country on Earth next to the youngest country on Earth. And within, of course, this old rocks, you have all the elements. You have gold, you have silver, you have copper, you've got diamonds, you've got, you've got everything. And uh, with Greenland, they are the first and only country within the EU to uh, leave the EU. They did that in 1985. Greenland now wants to claim independence from Denmark, and it's quite interesting uh, what happens if, if, if they decide to do that. Uh, are they going to look west? Are they going to look east? Where are they going to look? I'm quite sure they will mostly look to the Arctic, and they will try to strengthen the ties to the countries which share that heritage and, and share those interests. If we then look at what Canada and Iceland have in common, sort of business cycle-wise or business-wise, of course the trade between the countries is, is quite low because they're producing the same goods. You don't need to buy from someone that's producing exactly the same as you are. But that also means that their business cycles are quite similar. The export revenues of Iceland are 37% in dollars and 27% in euros. The reason being that Iceland mostly produces commodities. If we look at uh, the, the export uh, revenues of Canada, they're around 75% in dollars. But that's also given the, the neighbor Canada has, which Iceland doesn't. But both countries are basically exporting a lot of resources, exporting a lot of commodities. And most commodities internationally are priced in dollars. If we then look at what should Iceland do to grow out of its problems, it should, of course, adopt another currency because that immediately would lower interest rates. Ten-year interest rates in Iceland are around 8% now. International rates in Canadian dollars or, or pounds or euros are around 2%. Uh, the credit spread on Iceland internationally is around 2%. So 2 plus 2 means 4. So if Iceland would adopt another currency, it would immediately cut the interest rates in Iceland in half, which would mean a massive improvement uh, for households and companies, and that again would drive investments, which then again would create more jobs and, and increase real disposable income. So. If we look at the systemic improvements that need to be made, I see that just to completely take the risk of defaulting in 2016 out of the picture, it's quite simple. All of this can be uh, made to happen within uh, a quarter of a year or, or two quarters. And these are four things. So they need to desperately shrink the public sector. There is a fiscal deficit of uh, of, uh, they're, they're forecasting it to come down to 2-3% this year, but I'm sure it will be higher. Uh, they should, of course, abolish the capital controls, which is the most important thing. And I think they should do that by adopting unilaterally a new currency, especially the Canadian dollar. But also given the sad experience that the Icelanders had with the uh, financial system collapsing, they should do away with the notion of a lender of a last resort. There shouldn't be a public guarantee for private banks. So uh, by adopting unilaterally an international currency, you automatically get rid of the lender of last resort. The banks become their own, uh, they're, they are liable for their own business. There is also another thing. They, yeah, they can sort of make better use of their resources. Uh, Iceland is very commodity rich and it's also very energy rich uh, because uh, it's on the lies between the two tectonic plates of, of America and Eurasia and uh, you have uh, an enormous uh, geothermal activity there. 
So Icelanders are using, are producing 10 times more energy than they can actually consume at home. But what do they do with all that additional energy? They're actually selling it to heavy industries in Iceland. Uh, for instance, Rio Tinto has a, has a big uh, uh, aluminum uh, plant in Iceland, Alcoa has one, and some other companies. But they can make better use of this energy, and uh, I think they should connect to the European grid simply by putting in a cable, an interconnector, and uh, they can fetch much higher prices there than they can in, uh, by selling this to heavy industries in Iceland. There's also the opportunity of then harvesting the, the water, the hydro possibilities of the east coast of Greenland. Uh, the cable to Greenland would only be around 200 kilometers. Uh, the cable to uh, Scotland would be around 1,200 kilometers. And these uh, projects are, are very commercially viable. The payback period is within five years uh, of these cables. So I think it's quite simple for Iceland to grow out of its problems. The most pressing issue right now is to get rid of the capital controls, and that can be done. And uh, I think Icelanders would welcome all help, and I would especially welcome all help from Canada in that respect. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Ársæll Valfels and anybody who can pronounce my first name will get a bottle of scotch. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you Fred for inviting us to talk here and um, uh, uh, in Heather's talk uh, what you see is a little bit uh, the change in focus that we are experiencing in Iceland. The change in focus post crash um, where the focus immediately went, uh, for, uh, went to Europe and, and to Europe as our uh, sort of partners and potential partners and, and potential uh, uh, business area and also uh, part of a of, uh, way to, to, to connect uh, to a larger political um, uh, uh, system, the European system. But um, the, the effects of the financial crash that we saw uh, manifesting itself in, in 2008 are just about to uh, mature enough that we in, in I, what we Icelanders and we are seeing globally is that perhaps the EU is um, standing on its m uh, most testing times, and um, the question whether to, for Icelanders to, whether to join the EU or not um, is a little bit put forward a little bit too early, um, and the, the 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 sentiment in Iceland is shifting away. And what Heather's talk is. Uh, demonstrates is that the, 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 the focus or the vision of Icelanders and their place in the world is moving away from Europe and the, getting more into the Arctic and our, our neighbors such as Canada, <coughs> Greenland and the Nordics. But um, uh, I am, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, Heather is, um, uh, has, has uh, uh, talked about the vision and the, the change in ideas that is taking place in Iceland. But I'm going to try to give, or give my, in a very brief account, a very complex story uh, of, of, of the path, uh, what happened uh, in the path that we've, uh, we, uh, that ended up in, in Iceland uh, being in the place that it is today. And this is a picture of the Icelandic flag flying in Spain. This is in Madrid, in the protests in Madrid. And the Spanish have um, basically taken the Icelandic way of, of, of dealing with the financial crisis and uh, created the notion of a, of, a, of a model, an Icelandic model on how to deal with the crisis. And, uh, and ca which is captured in the, in the slogan, Todos somos Islandia, we're all Icelanders. Um, which w w Icelanders were taken by total surprise when we saw this. <laughs> total surprise, all of a sudden, you know, we have a population of 300,000, and we start getting calls from Spanish journalists, you know, a nation of 70 million saying, oh, teach us to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did it all come about? Um, basically, it was, we were swept up in a financial tornado. Um, the financial tornado starts after Alan Greenspan's lower interest rates in 2001. Financial markets um, become uh, flooded with easy money, 
And basically what happened is that German banks um, f uh, recycled through Wall Street, funded Iceland's l largest boom in, in the Icelandic history. And this is the all share index, and um, I, it, it grows almost eightfold in uh, four or five years. Um, uh, it was a very nice time, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> On my meager salary uh, uh, in the university, I could use my uh, meager university salary to pay for a um, flight to New York and dine in a three Michelin star restaurant next to Keanu Reeves. That's a purchasing power. I sort of like, yeah, I like it. It's nice. <laughs> and it's gone now, unfortunately. Well, uh, from the university, salary, my salary from the university at least. Um, and but. Um, driving here into Toronto and seeing all your skyscrapers and the buildings being built now, um, that smelled a little bit familiar. I can <laughs> tell you. <laughs> Enjoyed while it lasts, at least. <laughs> so, we had the, 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 the cash from the international financial system being funneled through the CDOs created by Wall Street. Um, the reason why is that Iceland had a very good credit rating, we had a AAA rating, uh, and we had slightly higher interest rates, which meant that it was a perfect fit to lever up uh, the CDOs um, a little bit, increase the yield, increase the fee of the banking institutions who were, who were organizing it. And I, I'm, I've been told that at least 40% of all CDOs issued had Icelandic debt within it. And so basically a just pile of cash uh, an avalanche of a pile of cash just flowed over Iceland. And we saw the same construction boom as you have, and uh, 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 we saw a, a lot of expansion, Icelandic bankers flying all over the world, trying to acquire assets, Icelandic entrepreneurs buying up the high street in, in the UK, and so on. However, all good things come to an end, and as we see, after the collapse of the Lehman Brothers, the, the, the capital flows start to reverse, the liquidity in the market starts to deteriorate. And these banks, which grew from a two times GDP to 11 times GDP, collapsed. And uh, our good fortune was to be a small nation of only 300,000 people with no way of having the government backing it up. There was no way for 300,000 people to absorb 11 times GDP worth the uh, size of a banking system. If you look at uh, comparative, um, uh, comparative figures, I believe the U.S., the size of the banking system in the U.S. is about three times the GDP, if I remember correctly. If you look at Europe currently, the European banking system is about 12 times GDP of Europe. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Um, so what did we do? What happened? Well, basically the politicians were left out of control. There was nothing they could do, so they basically um, had to impose a, a, an emergency uh, legislation. And the Emergency Act of October 6, 2008, uh, what happened is that the government took over control of the banks, the banks couldn't get any funding, um, uh, and altered the order of uh, claims with depositors. Whereas, and this is a significant issue, and which is still being debated and contested in front of courts, especially the EFTA court, where the Dutch and the British government are, 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 are uh, or the EFTA court and the EU are, are, are disputing Iceland and the illegality of the, these acts, is that we guarantee the deposits within our nation state. Um, and that is, as being a member of the EEA, um, we have um, common, we have shared rules and regulations in the, fi in, in the financial industry, um, and uh, due to political reasons in the EU, the issue of deposit guarantee and the issue of claim orders and, and so on was intentionally left vague, as the EU was was uh, uh, agreeing upon these rules and regulations, because it was a highly political sensitive issue. Because if the rules and regulations would be very clear, for example, that there is a, a, a government guarantee on the deposits within the German banks, all the assets would flow from the failing, the, the, the lesser uh, credible states to the, to the stronger state. So th this was intentionally left away by the, by the European Union, and this is what Iceland is maintaining that uh, there is no state guarantee, and it had, it had, had the legal right to only 
uh, guarantee the, 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 claim, the deposits within, within Iceland, the boundaries of the nation state. When, this, when Iceland, the Icelandic government uh, made this uh, clear, and um, this was made famous in a, in a, in a telephone uh, call between Alistair Darling, the then uh, uh, Chancellor Exchequer, and our um, Mr. Mattisen, Minister of Finance, where the uh, Minister of Finance uh, uh, states that uh, deposits within the nation states are guaranteed. The response of the UK was imposed immediately uh, uh, anti-terror law against Iceland. And uh, what they did is that they froze all the assets of the Icelandic nation and corporates, pri both private and public. For a while, even the, the UK, even because, they, um, uh, because of the anti-terror act, it was effective immediately and it was cross-national, uh, cross-borders borders within the EU. And temporarily, they even managed to freeze the currency reserves of the Republic. And that was a f very frantic moment in Iceland history where we, we didn't know if we had the currency to import fuel for a while. Um, and Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, went on BBC basically saying that, uh, claiming that uh, the, the UK was freezing all Icelandic assets wherever they are to be found. This is what he said publicly. Not too, you know, not very <laughs> popular <laughs> with Iceland. Uh, 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 Gordon Brown and uh, I. I uh, try to think what happens if he will ever step foot in Iceland. But um, what happened is that then basically the Icelandic banks uh, were forcibly dissolved. Um, uh, we have, uh, during the, the, the crash we had two failing banks. One, um, one of the banks, Köpling Bank, which was the largest bank, still had operations operating in the UK, which had been um, uh, uh, which had been uh, monitored and authorized by the Financial Services Authority in the UK. But they, despite being a healthy bank, uh, and um, uh, it was still uh, disintegrated by the, by the, by the uh, UK government. And so we are left in a situation where we basically don't have a banking system, a uh, functioning banking, banking system. Um, what happens is that the central bank Im imposes immediately currency controls and just takes control of the payment system and focuses on the balance of payments and payments within, the, within Iceland. And to their, um, to their credit, um, our credit cards never stopped working. They stopped working for a brief period outside of Iceland. Throughout, throughout all of this crisis, you could still use your credit card abroad. And which is qu quite remarkable, actually, where you, know, you have a total default on your financial system. Um, um, soon after, Iceland uh, um, is, is, is uh, faced with the question of funding, and it applies to the IMF in order to, for a stand standby agreement, and um, uh, gets the assistance of the IMF to, to come up with a plan to fund um, the, the balance of payments and the funding needs of the, of the country. Prior priorities are given to products and services, and uh, that's where basically we are still today. Um, uh, and the problem with imposing such strict currency controls is that once they are in place, as Heather has been describing, it's extremely difficult to un uh, unwind them. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to, to, to lift them off. Um, here is a picture of uh, the Icelandic uh, krona trade weighted in, in index inverted, which means that uh, as it is moving up, um, uh, it's depre depreciating in value. And we see it's hovering around this, this uh, uh, around the value of 210, 220. Uh, but the, the pressures currently, the honeymoon days of currency controls and of, of businesses and, and, and uh, both business and public, um, you know, um, excusing the government for using these harsh measures, the honeymoon days are over. And what people are now try, uh, you know, trying to focus and find ways to, 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 to circumvent the currency controls of, as, as much as they can, which leaves, uh, as Heather was describing, as, as you put these controls in place, the asset starts to move away from the, from, the, from the system and being hidden and kept away, which, as he pointed out, increases the risk of, of the Republic becoming default in, in, uh, in, uh, in foreign currency. 
which is the single largest um, uh, uh, risk today. Although I think the, the government and, uh, uh, and the debate in Iceland is, is, is actively trying to uh, move the issue forward and, and th uh, moving towards a solution. Um, so we're in this situation where the currency controls uh, um, are in place and what they create uh, in time is that they start to create different types of prices. And, the, and the, the, the banking crisis shifts to, towards uh, a debt crisis and, um, uh, and a currency crisis. And um, this, is the currency, this is the currency crisis uh, that we're, we're dealing with. And so the other legacy of the banking crisis is the debt crisis. Initially we had claims against the Icelandic uh, financial system 11 times of GDP. Now we have claims against the financial system, which is two times GDP. So you see, just by allowing the private banks to, be co to go bankrupt, we managed to do a massive debt restructuring for the system. Maybe It's maybe not enough, um, remains to be seen, but, um, uh, but at least this is the largest piece of the debt restructuring, and majority of the pain was borne by German banks, funneled through Wall Street. So um, this is one form of, you know, and, uh, using the, the code that we have within our system uh, to uh, address the problem when you are stuck in a situation where your assets have basically depleted and you have a massive pile of debt against you. Um, what happened further is that uh, court cases start to arise and a massive complex legal quagmire um, uh, becomes uh, the norm in Iceland because you have all these claimers against the bank and what they're trying to do, they're trying to find all the ways to convert your, the private debt claims, the private debt claims they have and make them public because they want to get their money back and they're tr trying to find ingenious ways to make the taxpayer pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues that we had is that we had extremely high indebtedness in foreign currency of private parties both household and corporates. Now, um, this issue was um, contested and raised within the, uh, within the judicial system. And what the Icelandic courts eventually ruled upon, um, based on the Icelandic law, was that the, the, the indexation of the, uh, of, the, of the loans into foreign currency was unlawful, and that shaved even further, about five to 10 percent, it's, it's still being, Estimated, but it's about five to ten percent of GDP was, was shaved off there by that court ruling, which means that the Icelandic public has to pay less. Further, the banks, uh, as they were restructured, their balance sheet was basically just created anew, and uh, they were uh, that was done. They took the assets at the discount um, uh, uh, and sort of like just calculated with a plug-in called the funding um, because the funding wasn't there, but you know they just created it uh, against the central bank. Um, and the, da the bank debt relief programs which were, were launched, they bring the value of the, of the, of the, the private debt against house, household and corporates to a, uh, to a lower and most likely manageable uh, 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 level. Uh, in regards to the public sector, the, the largest and the most famous fallout of the collapse of the banks are the claims of the, U <coughs> the government of the UK and government of the Netherlands against I uh, Iceland because Iceland had, uh, there was an Icelandic bank called Landsbanki which operated branches in, this, in these countries and they, the branches had deposits and the deposits uh, were not guaranteed by the Icelandic emergency law. The, the British, and the uh, British and the Dutch government immediately tried to convert that uh, into a claim uh, against the Icelandic Republic. Although what we see ambitious now is that the, 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 winding, uh, the estates of the old collapsed banks will uh, be able to, to pay for, for the majority of it. But the Icelandic government was in a very bad negotiation position and the IMF was used f uh, brutally against the Icelandic government by the Dutch and the British. And um, it, Iceland was basically, the Icelandic government was forced to sign a contract uh, to which would uh, uh, um, uh, turn these private debts into public, uh, again, uh, guaranteed by the government, and they would uh, uh, have the, uh, the payout would be the equivalent of paying 4 to 5% for the, uh, 
four to five percent of Iceland GDP annually for a period from 2017 to 2023. And that was a contract which was totally, totally unacceptable for the Icelandic population. What happened then is that our president turned that into a uh, uh, refused to sign the bill, which went to a referendum, and the peop people resoundingly voted 98% no, which is a dangerous idea. To tie together the claim order of banks to, to what, democracy? That's strange. Um, Although we've, we've, ma we've managed to keep the public debt, it's, it's still very high, it's, uh, according to the latest report of the IMF, it's 90%. And the total national debt is still it's extremely high, about 240% of GDP. Although uh, there are assets against these liabilities, and much of this needs to be restructured even further. Um, and, well, as we see, the, the, uh, uh, the fogs, uh, the, the post-crash fog is is lifting, um, what we see is that, yes, we have a resource-based economy, so as Heather uh, described very well here uh, before me, uh, which is resource-driven. Um, eff effectively managed and resource-driven, we, we are starting to experience GDP growth, we see export values rise again, we see tourism at record levels, and our unemployment is starting to come down. Um, and private consumption uh, 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 to rise again. As Heather uh, described here, uh, is that uh, the currency controls and the currency uh, um, is the single lar largest um, uh, uh, th threshold or the problem for uh, getting Iceland onto a growth path again. Uh, although having an independent currency uh, assisted in, in lowering the real wages of the public sector of the public official sector, like, which was uh, something that you, uh, which is contrasted to Greece. In Greece, you basically have to either lower the wages or fire people. The devaluation assisted in lowering the real wages of people in the public sector. Um, so, um, the most pressing issues in post-crash recovery, it's we need to go further in debt restructuring, in both domestic and, uh, and, and foreign private debt. Uh, as Heather has been describing, the most pressing issue is to, to gain another, uh, get Iceland back on the path to growth by connecting it directly into financial markets by adopting another currency. Um, and then what comes out of a, a banking crisis, a currency crisis and a debt crisis is most usually often a political crisis. It's very difficult for the political institutions to deal with this. Um, and currently, we are dealing with uh, somewhat of a political paralysis, but fortunately, it's only, it's only about uh, 12 months to the next elections. Further, the, in order to, uh, what happens when you have a debt crisis and you have a ballooning of the, of the public debt, public, public debt needs to be serviced. Uh, we've seen an increase in the, in the, the, the tax rates in Iceland with wealth tax introduced, capital gains tax uh, uh, raised considerably. And there needs to be further tax reform as we see unwinding of the of the debt of the, the, the debt pile. However, to explain, and this is what I think that the people uh, that I was showing you on the first slide, what the people in in, in Spain and people in Madrid are seeing is that uh, what what it points to an uh, uh, Icelandic model in dealing with such a, a massive crisis, and that is the key is to fight the pressure of turning private debt into public debt. And the reason why is that the higher the public debt, the more difficult it's going to be for you to grow. Um, and you're also throwing the bill after, for a crisis which is creating present times on future generations. That's why the people in Madrid are looking for Iceland, looking at Iceland. Another thing that it might be a part of, or that points to a, 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 an Icelandic model of handling the crisis, was moving back, moving back to a nation state. And what happened is that as the banks collapsed, the government took control of the management of the old estates, which helped preserve the sovereignty of the nation. Then this idea of mixing democracy into the financial system 
mixing de democracy into a technical legal debate on who gets paid out and what and, and at what time. And that, I think, and remains to be seen, might be an idea which the political powers di dislike the most. <laughs> But um, it's something that is resounding with people all over the world. And we saw Papa Andreo in his last minutes as president uh, suggesting that the Greek nation should be asked in, on how to deal with these issues. But the European settled back didn't like it. <laughs> so this is to uh, conclude. Um, uh, we. Uh, this is what I would sort of like summarize in a very, very complex picture, what might be the uh, Icelandic model in handling this crisis. And I'm looking very much forward to hear your questions and take part in the discussion. Thank you.